Hi, my name is Deborah Fox, and I'm the director of NYS Baroque in Ithaca and Syracuse, and of Pegasus Early Music in Rochester, New York. Our two organizations have been collaborating for eight years on our Early Music Concert Series, and this past year has been all virtual. Today's concert is part of our Pegasus Rising and NYS Baroque Young Artist Series. These series seek to promote and encourage emerging new performers who are involved in early music. I'm so pleased to introduce today's program, O oh Stars Conspiring Against Me, performed by the vocal ensemble, The New Consort. Winners of the American Prize in Chamber Music, The New Consort is a project-based solo voice ensemble founded in 2015. It's quickly made embracing stylistic contrasts one of its hallmarks. And you're certainly going to hear that today. Musical variety is an integral part of the ensemble's identity. From Renaissance polyphony to contemporary and non-classical works, nothing is off limits. The members of the new consort are Madeline Applehealy, Julie Bosworth, Elisa Sutherland, Nathan Hodgson, Brian Mummert, and Jonathan Woody. And today they're joined by guest theorbo player, Danny Zanutini Frank. So just a little housekeeping before you meet the new consort's founder and director, Brian Mummert. Please feel free to enter your questions and comments into the YouTube chat box at any time during the concert. Uh, the members of the new concert are here with us and they will respond. There's a link to your program with text and translations in the description area below your YouTube picture. Now, we are thrilled to be able to offer all of our concerts this season for free. At the same time, we are genuinely committed to paying our artists their professional fees and many of our artists have lost most of their concerts and fees for this season because of the pandemic and so much of their work has been canceled. So if you are so moved to make a donation to support our programs, we appreciate it. There are links in the description and also we will post them in the chat box. I would like to add, as this is the final program of our 2020-21 season, that your donations have truly made a difference in this year of the pandemic and have truly kept the music coming. So on behalf of Pegasus Early Music, NYS Baroque, and all of our fabulous musicians, we are extremely grateful. Thank you so much. So welcome, Brian Mummert. So happy to have you here today and looking forward to this um, concert of the new consort, uh, a name which combines both new and old. Um, so tell us about the new consort. Sure. Uh, so first of all, we're so excited to be here. Um, I think that the fact that you mentioned that our name combines new and old really captures one of the key things about the ensemble. Uh, we started in 2015 uh, when I was in grad school at Peabody. Um, and one of the sort of key tenets of the group is that uh, we're trying to introduce people to new perspectives, new experiences, make sure they're hearing new voices, regardless of what kind of music they like when they show up, right? So uh, we combine early music and new music and some standard repertoire stuff as well with uh, folk songs from around the world and music utilizing non-Western traditions and um, always with an eye toward trying to tell some kind of story or outline some kind of theme usually with the concept that we give. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, this one uh, is called O Stars Conspiring Against Me. Um, and it's all about women in music. And you have um, two of my favorite women composers mm -hmm. on the program, Francesca Caccini and the wonderful Barbara Strozzi. Um, and their lyrics are usually about women as well. 
Yes, and uh, both of these songs that we'll sing are definitely, uh, they definitely have a perspective about the position of women in society, uh, about uh, the just treatment of women in, in that society. Um, the first, uh, which will be sung as a solo by the wonderful Julie Bosworth, uh, is uh, Que To Fatio by Francesca Caccini, um, which is, is all about sort of the man who's spurning this, this, this woman and wants her to die so that she doesn't bother him anymore, right? Uh, which seems, which we are sort of stories we hear all the time, but but when you actually get to hear from that woman, it's it seems remarkably cruel, right? Um, similarly, uh, there's this in uh, Lusignolo by uh, Barbara Strozzi. Um, there's this parallel drawn between um, the nightingale who sings out of sort of anger and sorrow and uh, a woman who's been raped. Uh, and while that's not sort of the kind of parallel we're used to hearing in, uh, in Baroque music and in sort of Renaissance Italian poetry, um, you know, leave it to Barbara Strozzi to set a text that, uh, that highlights the sort of beauty arising from pain and injustice that, uh, that sort of highlights the female perspective in that way. Mm. Yeah, I well, and I think that I think that the way that we think about uh, the place of women in our society is deeply tied to uh, the way that stories get told about women in media. And you know, there is no sort of medium older than myth, right? Than the Greek and Roman myths, which is where so much of the influence for the art of the Renaissance and the Baroque comes from. Uh, which then influences our culture now. And so you you turn back to these myths and, and these stories and you see the root of a lot of the misogyny and uh, a lot of the sort of social problems, I think, that we see is perpetuated in society even now. Music as social comment is not something new. Yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> and it's again, right? We, we like to think that, like, you know, Bob Dylan invented the concept in 1960. Right. But uh, no, 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 no. They've been, you know, women and, and women have been making their voices heard for, you know, 400 years. It just so happens that these particular women were the daughters of powerful men in the Florentine Camerata. And so that's why their music is the music that gets preserved from this time. But it does mean that we have the voices of mm -hmm. some women who are who are protesting the kind of treatment and views that uh, in, in different ways, but allegorical ways, as you said, we're, we're, still, seeing, uh, we're still seeing people speak out against today. Mm -hmm. Yes, true. Okay, well, let us, without further ado, hear these pieces. Thank you. 
with us now Ben Roerth, who's the composer for the next piece, The Turn, 
which goes with a very famous piece by Monteverdi. Um, so welcome, Ben. I know you're uh, talking to us from England where we can see by the clock that it's 10 o'clock at night. Um, for us, it's in the afternoon. So thanks for joining us this late in the evening. Um, we can't wait to hear your piece and I'd love to hear you speak about it. Absolutely. Well, I'm really pleased that uh, that Brian is is uh, giving this piece another performance. It was it was written first in uh, 2016 when someone uh, asked if I could create a piece that interwove between all the different sections of Monteverdi's Lamento Dariana, and uh, I thought that um, I thought that really. Uh, one interesting aspect of, of Lamento Dariana was the fact that all of Monteverdi's Lament is entirely coming from one perspective of a sort of, of a woman scorned and, well, lamenting uh, on a beach. So I tried to turn this around slightly, uh, this perspective, um, and take a take a bit of a, a bit of a different look. Um, and in doing so, thought that I'd, I'd like to sort of take the whole thing down into one particular moment where their eyes meet, where uh, Tizio looks back from the boat and Ariana's on the beach and their eyes meet and he is filled with regret uh, at, at that particular point. And so all of my new movements are set within that, within that one moment uh, as, their, as their eyes, yeah, as their eyes meet. And the music takes lots of different little bits of inspiration from the Monteverdi and uses them in all sorts of different ways, some uh, aleatoric, some that are then put with uh, solos that are, are uh, that represent the two characters, um, uh, some that are that sort of describe the piece in a, in a, in a Monteverdi-esque restative style and um, uh, all of these throughout the piece uh, represent a, well, all, all of these reflect a, a kind of harmonic journey that looks to reflect on the, the idea of sound moving across distance and over water, um, and in particular looking to try and recreate uh, a sense of the Doppler effect that you get as, yeah, as sound moves across, uh, across distance. So all the way through the harmony, despite being sort of inflected with with uh, inspiration from the Monteverdi is always being twisted and turned as sound is uh, it, when, when experienced uh, in the phenomenon of the Doppler effect. Um, and I hope this is uh, yeah, a piece that uh, Brian and the new consort have enjoyed rehearsing and performing. I know you've, you've performed it once before, um, but I'm really pleased that you're doing it again. We did. One of the things that we've really enjoyed getting to revisit this piece for to present the digital North American premiere is uh, getting to sort of find all these often very clever, very subtle allusions to the original Monteverdi that are woven into the score of the turn. Uh, and having had more opportunity to spend time both with the Lomento Dariana by Monteverdi and with this piece, uh, over the last week or so that we've worked on this together, uh, you really find all these incredible sort of weavings between the two. Uh, and that's that's one of the things that's been really keeping us excited about sharing this music with you. So the two pieces are interspersed by sections, is that correct? Yes. So our audiences will hear some of the Monteverdi and then they'll hear some of Ben's piece and then back to the Monteverdi. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look at the texts that we have laid out in the program, uh, then you'll be able to track which composer's piece you're in. But <laughs> I would guess that you'll probably be able to tell regardless. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, um, it's such a delight to be able to speak to a composer because usually our composers are long dead. So uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I love that idea and I love the idea of modern composers um, being influenced and sort of working with early composers to create um, a new sound, which it sounds like you really are trying to do here. Absolutely. No, it's great. I mean, it's for me, it's such a, 
you know, when you when you kind of um, as a composer in this in this day and age in in the twenty first century, you basically you know music having having been th through much of history in such a sort of narrow gap. Well, you know, Western art music having been in, in such a sort of narrow space has suddenly gone like this and access to all different cultures and influences and musical styles and techniques um, is suddenly at our fingertips, which is fantastic. But it also means that as a composer, it, you almost have too much to choose from. So having, having something really specific to, uh, to react to is actually, is, 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 a really, uh, is a really interesting and sort of, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fantastic process that I, I really enjoy. Mm. What drew you to the Monteverdi piece in the first place? Uh, well, I mean, I love I love Monteverdi's music. It's he's uh, he's certainly I'm, I'm a a big fan. I'm a singer myself, um, and I have done I spent a lot of time singing uh, singing sort of uh, late 16th, early 17th century um, Italian music. Um, so it has a, it has a special place, uh, let's say, um, and. Uh, yeah, I'd, I've sort of yeah always been been sort of keen to look at bits of of Monteverdi in particular and react to that because he himself was was so progressive in what he was doing harmonically. Um, and, well, and what he was doing, in fact, everything that he was doing, he was he was so progressive. Um, and it's it's the sort of music that people look back at even now and are are surprised by you, you know even to to modern ears having having experienced an entire century of sort of music having gone through so many twists and turns of, you know, serialism and et cetera, uh, audiences still seem to listen to Monteverdi and, and feel a genuine sense of surprise at where he takes you musically. Um, so it's, a, yeah, a, a great composer to, uh, to be able to interact with. No.
thank you to the new consort for that incredible performance of Monteverdi's Lamento d'Ariana and Ben Roweth's The Turn. Uh, there's a lot to think about there. Um, let me ask both of you, we are now joined by Julie Bosworth, who's a singer in the ensemble. Um, so Brian and Julie, can you talk a little bit about uh, the challenges and the similarities and the differences of singing old music, early music, which our audiences are used to hearing, and singing new music? Well, I think that as as far as the musicians that are performing the music go, and especially um, us as singers, that it requires almost the same kind of singer to both early music and new music, uh, just because of the intricacies and the clarity that is needed. Mm. So they're they're similar in the approach that you you might use with vocal technique, at least in my perspective. Um, and sometimes when singing new pieces, the there's almost sort of like a neo baroque way of that the pieces are composed, especially like like Ben's piece. Um, and so in that way, it is very similar so that it's, it's trying to emulate the style of the Baroque period. Yeah, I totally agree with what you said, Julie. Um, I think there's also a way in which the same type of singer is drawn to both kinds of music. I think both working in early music, particularly if you're working on the fringes of early music, working on repertoire that you have to make new editions of or do a lot of digging through archives to find scores or or that sort of work is very similar to working on new music where you might be sort of you know working with a composer uh you're not you're not able to sort of you know go open your 10 Verdi arias for soprano book and and learn rep from there you have to do some some outside digging and research and, and engage in the music in a in an intellectually different kind of way and so I think people who are drawn to that are often drawn to working both in early and in new music. Mm -hmm. So I think that it sounds like there's a research aspect and also uh, an improvisational aspect as well to some time. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that the sort of emphasis on ornamentation uh, and sprezzatura in ornamentation, right? This idea of ornamentation being sort of carefree and off the cuff. Um, is very much related to jazz, for example. Um, and so actually, particularly in instrumentalists, I see a lot of people who overlap um, jazz and early music. For example, uh, our theorbist in our first two pieces uh, is also a jazz guitarist. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, think, I think the sort of improvisatory nature, uh, particularly of instrumental Baroque music often lends itself really well to uh, to jazz musicians. Um, it's, it is kind of a magic, I think, when an ensemble particularly sings together and breathes together and particularly in person these days. But what are, what, what are clues that you give each other? And what, um, what is it like to sing in an ensemble of six people all together? Well, these clues have become very apparent to us after singing masked for about 15 months that the cues that we really give to each other other than breathing is really recognizing like i mean in addition to like see the body of the breath um just being able to see someone's mouth i mean you can learn so much you can see a vowel shape um mm -hmm. you know can see length versus width and there, there's just so many cues that come from your fellow singers mouths and and taking cues from those and I have missed that so much and so glad <laughs> to have been seeing in person like with these fabulous fabulous colleagues mm -hmm. yeah I think I think it's the little clues that we give each other that make it so sort of intuitive feeling to align things now that we suddenly lost all of a sudden um, and didn't realize, uh, you know, when people are sort of turning their diphthongs, ow, oh, like when that happens together. And, um, but, but I, think, I think that 
some of those clues will also be very obvious to your viewers if you if they go back and watch. Um, they'll certainly see me leading a lot of the entrances just with a nice clear breath. Um, they'll see when that leadership passes off to other members of the ensemble. Um, that's actually always something I find interesting to watch at concerts is to mm -hmm. watch especially small ensembles without conductors pass leadership off between members for different movements or different chunks of a piece and sort of see, try to figure out why that, that particular person is leading that section. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much, Julie Bosworth and Brian Mummert of the New Consort for this glimpse into how an ensemble works together and, and how the music uh, goes, no matter what century it's from. For our audience, um, please hang in there. Uh, the new consort will be available on the YouTube chat. So please send us your questions and comments and we'll respond in the next few minutes. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks everyone.